how could it be that a community of people that dwelt in Iraq or Mesopotamia, the land between the two rivers, for 2,700 years, a thousand years before Muhammad, how was it that this people became so reviled and so distasteful as neighbors that they were candidates for extermination and complete seizure of their property? And how is it possible that Semites, Arabs, came in league, hand in hand, with the Nazis who were completely anti-Semitic and considered the Jews and the Arabs to be the lowest eugenic evolutionary rung. What was the binding ingredient that brought the Arabs to the Nazis against the Jews? And that ingredient was oil. Hitler wanted it, the Arabs had it. So, let's go back and begin at kind of the beginning. And we will find out what exactly caused this issue with the Semites. Now, does everybody in the room know what a Semite is? Anybody here know what a Semite is? All right, a Semite is the descendant. Noah had three sons. One of them was Shem. The descendants of Shem are Shemites, also known as Semites. And one of those was Abraham. And Abraham was the father of many nations. And among his nations were the Arabs and the Jews and, of course, many other groups. And um, 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 that actually is part of the problem between the Arabs and the Jews, this whole idea of whose son is more precious, whether it's Jesus or, 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 or Ishmael or, um, or Israel. <clears throat> so if we really want to take this back, we should take it back to approximately 627, to the Medina extermination. Now, the Medina extermination is not one that they will teach you about, but uh, everyone here has heard of Mecca and Medina. But what you don't know is that Medina was originally a uh, th thriving city with a thriving Jewish population. <coughs> the word Medina comes from the Hebrew Medinat, which is variously translated to mean the city or the district or, 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 or the state, uh, depending upon the context. In uh, 627, Muhammad uh, took his uh, new religion, Islam, and uh, came into Medina after Mecca and wanted the Jewish community and the Christian community to um, abandon their religion and join his. Well, the Christians would not do this. They had spent more than half a millennium fighting for their religious freedom. And the Jews, of course, would not do this. They had been uh, uh, worshiping uh, their, um, uh, their books and their God and their religion for millennia, OK, for millennia. So, the Jews of Medina would not cooperate, and Muhammad had a, the approximate uh, 600 of them, 608, 620, lined up in the square, and they had all their heads chopped off, and took off their women, uh, took off with their women, and then continued the drive north. Um, and uh, the armies of Muhammad in what historians call the Islamic conquest then took over the north of, uh, of the Arabian Peninsula. Actually, what's an Arab? An Arab is a descendant of the, uh, of, 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 of the Arabian Peninsula. 
um, and uh, then of course into North Africa and uh, much of the Near East and Middle East are creating um, uh, an Islamic controlled region, empire, Islamic empire, in which uh, Jews and Christians were not allowed to observe their um, religion um, as equal members of society. They were made, turned into second and third class citizens. The word for this is dimmi. Does everybody here know the word dimmi? Who, who does not know dimmi? Okay. Dimmi is also known as the people of the book uh, or other second class citizens were not allowed to build new houses of worship, were sometimes had to, a Jew sometimes had to wear a Jewish star, uh, a funny hat, special clothing, they might have to ride a, a donkey when the Arab would ride a horse, and mainly they had to pay a special tax once a year, and they had to pay it in a act of uh, submission where they would kind of bow a little bit and get their head slapped a little bit. That was part of the text. You paid and you got your head clapped. Um, now, part of the reason for this is that uh, Muhammad really believed that the Jews had fabricated, and the Christians had fabricated and corrupted God's word. Okay? For instance, they believed that the guy up uh, um, uh, on the mountain whose father almost sacrificed him, that was not uh, Isaac, that was Ishmael. And they uh, also believed that Jesus Christ was never crucified. Uh, I have with me here um, five, trans five authentic translations of... Verse 4, 157 of the Quran, uh, the uh, chapter 4, subnamed the women, where I have the Sahi International, the, the Piktal, the Yusuf Ali, the Shakir, and the, the Muhammad Sarwar, and the Mosin Khan translations. And they all say about the saying that um, they slew him not nor crucified him, with, in reference to Jesus. Uh, there was an imposter. So, Muhammad originally prayed to Jerusalem, and at the time that he had his extreme parting of the ways with the Jews, turned his backside to Jerusalem when he prayed, and prayed to Mecca. There are many, many similarities in uh, uh, Islamic thought and uh, uh, Hebraic thought. Um, for instance, you've heard of the word uh, Hajj. Hajj is a, pil is, a, is a pilgrimage, and it's named for the uh, Jewish holidays, which are Chag, because in uh, uh, Arabic, Arabic uh, the G and the J are interchangeable, so you have Gabriel and you have Jabril. So, Around 600, some say 620, comes the Pact of Umar. And this is the time, really, that I should have said it is the codification of the notion of Jews and Christians as dimmies, meaning second-class citizens who don't have the same rights, who are considered to be vile, who sometimes must wear stars and funny outfits, and things of that nature. Now, this is a very good time for me to make it clear that although Jews were persecuted in many Arab lands, there is no way to generalize on the treatment of Jews uh, during these centuries under Muslim control. In some cases, the Jews were persecuted, they were murdered, they uh, were forced to convert, and in other cases, they were uplifted, they were ennobled, they were held in high esteem. Uh, it just depended 
upon the century, upon the region, upon the rulers, on how Jews were treated. This is very important to, um, to understand. Especially when you think about the fact that, uh, can you hear me in the back? Especially when you think about the fact of all the horrors that were going on against Jews perpetrated by Christians in Europe at approximately the same time frame. I'll give you another example. After the Inquisition, Catholic Church expels all the Jews. It is the Muslims, it is the Caliph, the, the, the Sultan, who brings, who takes the Jews in, and it says to the King of Spain, what a fool you are to get rid of these people. And the Sultan took the Jews in and uh, settled them across the Middle East, not to uh, toil and to, um, to schlep big stones up to make great edifices, but to thrive, to prosper, to invent, to excel, and to make taxes. <laughs> so it's really important not to generalize. But what is important to know is that whether Jews were reviled or whether Jews were revered, whether they were persecuted or whether they were put up on a pedestal, it was as dimmies with the permission of the ruling Islamic class. Now, we need to move up several centuries and we need to get into Zionism, the advent of Zionism. Anyone in the room, besides all my friends, know what the definition of Zionism is? Let's go to the students. I know Chaim knows. Do you know what the definition of Zionism is? No, mystical Judaism is, Kal is Kabbalah, which means reception which is why the place in the hotel that you check in is the same as the uh, religious theory. Uh, anybody else know what, 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 what you know? Yeah, the right for Jews to establish a homeland. That's part of it, the right of Jews to establish a homeland. Who else knows something about Zionism, one of the students? Anybody? Okay, Zionism is one thing. Jewish nationalism, that's it. Now, at the end of the 19th century, there was a, um, a move amongst many peoples to self-determine their own destiny and to shirk off the uh, shackles of ecclesiastic, monarchical, and dynastic reg uh, regimes. Sometimes these people identified themselves by a region between the, the valley between the two mountains, and sometimes by a uh, religion, and sometimes by a language. Whatever it was that gave them an identity, they had this urge to achieve self-determination. So you have the Armenians, you have the Hung Hungarians, you have the Greeks, in many ways you have the Japanese, and they all have one goal in mind, which is to achieve independence and self-determination. Amongst these many peoples were the Jews and the Arabs uh, approximately uh, a decade and a half later, but the Jews had that. Now, many of you have heard the falsity that the real problem with the uh, Jews in Palestine amongst their Arab brethren was the advent of the State of Israel. That's false. 1948. Or the presence of Zionism, or the involvement of Zionism. That's false. To the best of my knowledge, there never was a day of peace between Jews and their Muslim neighbors in Palestine going all the way back. There were, of course, times when there was more or less violence, more or less friction. But true peace between the Muslims and the Jews never obtained in 
Palestine. Let me give you an example. Uh, in approximately uh, 1895 to 1898, uh, um, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the Ottoman legislature passed a law that no Jews would be allowed to buy property in, um, in uh, Palestine. Uh, Jews would come in from all over the Ottoman Empire, uh, but um, uh, excuse me, Arabs would come in from all over the Ottoman Empire to settle, to, to do business. But when 50,000 Yemenite Jews tried to come up for religious purposes, that caused a problem. The Sultan himself wrote a letter to President Rutherford, uh, Rutherford B. Hayes, uh, offering uh, Palestine as a destination for uh, tourism. Everybody, all, all, all of the Americans are invited to visit Palestine, except Jews. That was in the 19th century. Now, I don't want you to think that none of the Jews were welcome in Palestine. It's true. In general, they were not. But in many cases, they were. I'll give you a perfect example. Once again, to avoid your drawing generalizations and generalities. The Hashishibi family, for example, in Palestine, welcomed the Jews and welcomed them as neighbors. They were tolerant. Of course, it didn't hurt that the Jews paid an extra three, four times the value for the property. So there was important families that did live in peace with the Jews. But usually, those who wanted to be neighborly and make peace were shouted down, beat down, and put off to the side so that the voices of peace could not prevail. Now let's move into the, um, the, the uh, Balfour Declaration period. At a point in time, uh, during World War I, the Balfour Declaration was issued by the British saying that amongst those who could go back to their home, that, 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 that the British Crown would look with favor on a um, Jewish homeland uh, that would, of course, uh, the whole spirit of which was that the Arabs would also make a homeland. Uh, You've all heard of the Balfour Declaration, right? But did you know that the Germans, during the war, had a similar declaration? And did you know the French had such a declaration? And did you know that Woodrow Wilson had such a declaration? Meaning the man behind self-determination, uh, international law. And did you know that even the Turkish Pashas in the Talat Declaration reversed their long-standing policy and echoed the concept of the Balfour Declaration as an official document and said, yes, Jews are welcome to uh, settle in this land. Of course, um, it was a matter of return. There were always Jews in Palestine. Um, but many of these Jews were completely non-industrial Jews. They were there for worship. They didn't work. They got paid to to, uh, to be and to be holy and all, the, all, all, all that stuff. The Zionist ethic brought industrial Jews, enterprising Jews, to build the Jewish home, homeland. Not only were these international declarations made, the whole concept of the Jewish homeland was then ratified by the international body, the supreme international body, the League of Nations, and inculcated into the, into the mandate for uh, Palestine that was given to the British. So this was not something that was manufactured on Downing Street, nor was it done at a moment's notice. It took years. Now this was too much for the local Arabs. Starting about 1920, Jews start trickling into Palestine. They're not Moroccan Jews. They're not Yemenite Jews. They're not Iraqi Jews. They're Polish Jews. 
they're Russian Jews. They don't speak Arabic. And they live in square houses. They even brought electricity. Remember when Kaiser Wilhelm came to Palestine in the 19th century, he brought his own generators. His own generators to make electricity. I have pictures lighting up the, uh, uh, the Judean hills. <clears throat> and basically, the Arabs said, we would rather live in subjugation as colonists under Britain than live as equals next to Jews. Now this is the whole thing. Equal. That's it. Can they live as equals side by side? Okay. So the Jews are coming. They're, um, uh, they're insular. Some are mixing, but most of them are in separate communities. <clears throat> the Jews are living where the Arabs are not. And um, there's a lot of violence. Uh, Arabs uh, uh, sometimes would see a guy, uh, a Jewish guy, walk along the street, stab him, keep walking. Sometimes ten of them would beat the guy up. Sometimes they'd lynch him. Sometimes they would just uh, rob him. Little, big, small acts of violence against the Jews. Mainly without defense, defenseless Jews. Eventually the Jews did learn how to defend themselves by organizing their own groups. Now, there came a point in 1928 when the Jews said, you know, I think we're going to sit down when we pray on Yom Kippur at the Wailing Wall. And the Arab community, chiefly through its leader, Husseini, the Mufti of Jerusalem, actually he's the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. Now does anyone know who made Husseini the Mufti of Jerusalem? <laughs> it was the British. The High Commissioner declared him to be the Mufti of Jerusalem and so that he could keep the peace while they were busy trying to get the oil out of Iraq and run a pipeline down to Haifa. And uh, just to make him a little more Mufti, they made him even Muftier, they made him the Grand Mufti. This is a designation. You have to remember something. You heard of the King of Jordan? Who made the King of Jordan the King? That was the King of England. Who made Faisal the King of, uh, um, of Iraq? The King of England. That's a different book, though. That's um, Richard Petroleum. You have to come down to Jupiter next week and hear you talk about that. So, the Jews say, look, we're in our own homeland. We're supposed to have national rights here. If we can't sit down and pray like equals, what's going on? And the Muslims say, under Sharia, you can't sit when you pray at the Wailing Wall. Now, most of you don't know why. The answer is that under Muslim tradition, the Wailing Wall is known as Al-Barak. Now, Al-Barak. What is Al-Barak? Well, there were very, very few Muslims in Palestine in the early centuries of Islam. In fact, the word Jerusalem never appears in the Quran. I recently heard an Al Jazeera Arabic interview. It's always interesting to hear the Al Jazeera Arabic interview instead of the English interview. And um, they asked this uh, professor from Bar, Bar Ilan, uh, Jerusalem is mentioned in the Quran. He said, not even once. And of course, you know, it's mentioned 360 or 370 times in the, uh, 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 in the Old and, and the New Testament. So when Muhammad died, they said that he went to the seventh heaven 
aboard a white-winged horse called Albarak, who flew to the furthest mosque, Al-Aqsa, the furthest. And he flew to Al-Aqsa Mosque and tethered his winged horse before ascending to heaven. And because Muhammad's winged horse was tethered at this wall, it became sacred for Muslims and verboten to Jews. Okay. So, um, the Jews sit down during Yom Kippur, and the Arabs have a small riot. They beat people up. They burn some books. And they warn the Jews, don't do that again. And the poor British don't know what to do because they have two impossible duties. They have to assure the religious freedom of the Jews in Palestine, their, national, their new national homeland, and they must assure the religious status quo of the Ottomans prior to the Jews getting there. And that included all the Sharia, and I've seen the actual arguments and the judgments about this. Okay. Come 1929, it's hot, and the Jews say, once again, we're going to sit down at the wall. And Husseini and the others warn, don't do it. And the British have established a policy these little old ladies are trying to sit at the British constables that pull the chairs out. So that, God forbid, these little old ladies in the heat of summer or the heat of the day can't sit, uh, sit down. Jews sit down, and Husseini, who was on the British tax rolls, who was paid by the British, whose entire apparatus of autonomy in Palestine was paid for by the British taxpayers, Husseini tells the, tells the British constables, look, there's a riot in the old city because the Jews are sitting down to break the Sharia. They're beating up the Jews. They're burning the little settles from the uh, Kotel. And so all the uh, constables go down to the old city and they try to take care of this riot. While the constables are at the old city, taking care of the riot, the main column of marauders goes to Hebron and decides to stage a terrible massacre. Defenseless Bible study um, students, what is sometimes called yeshiva buckers, these are just orthodox people, they have no um, uh, weapons, they were just there, were set upon they were, um, uh, some of them had their arms sliced off. Some of them were um, uh, uh, beaten up badly. Many were murdered. And they weren't just killed. They were killed according to their identity. Now what does that mean? That means that the baker was baked in his own oven. The traveler was crucified on a door. The scholar had his head cut open and they played with his uh, cranium, with his brain like a football. Babies were cut in half, and it would have been much worse had not righteous Muslim neighbors put a stop to some of it, put interposing themselves between the killers and the um, uh, between the killers and the innocents. Eventually, the Brits. What year is this? 
1929. No state of Israel. 1929. The Brits bring out the machine gun, the aerial machine gun units. They machine gun the marauders. They cut them down. They moved out a tank column, armored column from, I believe it was Iraq or Jordan, I forget which time would know. And they restored peace. And the headlines are all saying just this. How much time do I have left? I've got a few more decades. Okay. I'll have to make it fast now. Eventually, it becomes clear, because I have to abridge myself, that these two communities cannot live together. Comes 1933, who comes to power? Adolf Hitler. Arabs say, that's our guy. He believes what we believe. He wants to get rid of the Jews. He wants to boycott the Jews, which we have a boycott. And that boycott is the actual progenitor of the current BDS. The current boycott, divestment, and sanction movement originates with the Nazis and the Mufti of Jerusalem. That was the beginning of it. And now it, uh, it uh, goes on to campuses as though it is something new that happened yesterday. Hitler wants to uh, make them wear stars. All this makes sense to us. So we're all going to join the Nazi party. So they all head themselves down in, in Beirut and in Damascus and in Jaffa and in Tel Aviv and in Egypt and in, even in India. And they say, we want to, to German consulates and embassies say, we want to join the Nazi party. The foreign office says, you can't join the Nazi party. You're not our, our, our youths. And worse than that, you're Sunlights. Ironically, <clears throat> the Germans, through an agreement called the Transfer Agreement, which I wrote another book about, made an arrangement by which the Jews could escape from Germany and go into Palestine trading merchandise for money so they could leave with a pittance of their money. So the Germans were actually putting the Jews into Palestine and the Arabs thought that the Germans were actually the, the savior to their problem. Come 1936, 1937 period, the Peel Commission and the, finally the Peel Report says, okay, these two people can't live together, even during the reign of Hitler when there are refugees everywhere on this little piece of property. So I think we're going to make two states for two people. You ever heard of the two-state solution? That's it. And the Arabs say, never will we accept independence and statehood if it means living next to Jews who have equal, uh, e e uh, equality. In fact, I'm going to read you something, even if Charles tries to stop me because we're out of time. All right, good. Don't do it. Now I'm going to read you something here. Ready for this? Listen to this. Our hatred for the Jews dates from God's condemnation of them for their persecution and rejection of Jesus Christ and their subsequent rejection later of his chosen prophet, Muhammad. <coughs> Verily, the word of God teaches us, and we implicitly believe this, for a Muslim to kill a Jew ensures him an immediate entry into heaven and into the august presence of God Almighty. What more then can a Muslim want in this hard world? Now who wrote those little words? Was that a shopkeeper in the old city talking to his buddy? That was the king of Saudi Arabia in an official 90-minute protest to the foreign office. That document is actually from the British archives. More recently, Mohammed Morsi repeated that. 
Morrissey repeated, repeated that. Now, why do I bring up some of these things like the Medina extermination? And why do I bring up these remarks? Is it because I'm looking for something negative? I assure you, you will find very negative incidents in every religion. Every religion and in every holy book. But the Medina extermination was considered iconic in the Muslim tradition. In the same way that the Sermon on the Mount became iconic to the Christians, in the same way that the parting of the Red Sea became iconic to the Jews, this was a story they told over and over again to themselves, to, their, to the foreigners they intersected with, to the British, and they even told it to Adolf Hitler directly, eyeball to eyeball, in his own office, and they never stopped saying it. We know how to deal with the Jews much better than you. You kill them. No hiding of anything. No code words. All open radio broadcasts, all open um, uh, uh, posters where they would say in, uh, in heaven, Allah is your master, but on earth your master is Adolf Hitler. Okay, so 1937, the Muftis involved in the assassination of one of the high officials, the British officials in the Galilee. The Brits have had enough of this guy. They move to arrest him. He is, uh, he flees in the night dressed as a woman. You always flee dressed as women. And he went up to Iraq and the Mufti of Jerusalem became uh, part of a cabal called the Golden Square of uh, four upstart uh, soldiers in Baghdad who were um, Arab Nazis. I mean, these are people who had ensured that uh, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion was translated into Arabic. These are people, these are leaders who ensured that Mein Kampf was translated into Arabic and had interceded with the German Foreign Office to ensure that all the references of Hitler to anti-Semites were changed to anti-Jewish. In fact, I want it clear, when I say they were, anti they were Arab Nazis, I mean some of the Hitler Youth type organizations in Iraq actually went to Nuremberg and marched in the torchlight parades. In fact, even now, even now, if you go to the Syrian National Socialist Party on the internet, <coughs> you'll see that their logo is still a swastika in motion, even now. Okay. So, part of the arrangement is that Hitler needs the oil. The Arabs want the Jews out of Palestine. The Arabs want the British out of Palestine. And they decide that as part of Hitler's push across uh, uh, Europe into Russia, they are going to um, exterminate all the Jews of Iraq. The day, the day before, they uh, put the red chamsa, the red palm print, on all the homes. And they give a radio broadcast to all the, to all the Jews, stay in your home, pack a bag for three days. And it was just understood that, like in many other communities, the Jews would be sent into the, um, in, uh, into the desert to be slaughtered industrially. Well, just before that happened, uh, Kaduri, the chief rabbi, went to the acting mayor of Baghdad, threw his turban down on the floor, and said, don't do this. And this, another righteous Muslim, um, interceded, expelled the, um, uh, the Golden Square, expelled the Mufti. They all ran into Iran. And at that point, on June 1st, when the, uh, the um, 
uh, royal family and their appointees were coming back uh, into Baghdad, and the Brits were attempting to hold the oil fields that they needed. There was an absolute breakdown of law and order. The military, the police, civilians, common crit criminals, Bedouins, they all got together and went on a two-day killing spree against the Jews in the Jewish, neighbor, uh, Jewish neighborhoods. Babies were killed in front of their parents. Parents were raped in front of their, their, their uh, mothers were raped in front of their husbands. Daughters were raped in front of their fathers. Babies were cut in half and thrown into the Tigris. And everywhere, battering down the door, battering down the door, and the Jews running up to the roof going from rooftop to rooftop, and when they ran out of rooftops, they threw their kid down to a, a guy waiting on the bottom with a blanket to catch the kid. That's how come anyone lived from this. Hundreds of Jews were killed, more than the record will ever, will, will ever really show. We just really don't know. Many, were, many homes were burned. Eventually, the British, who were always monitoring this from eight miles outside town, came in and restored order. <clears throat> the Mufti went to Iran, tried to set up a Nazi state in Iran. At some point, uh, the Allies gave the uh, uh, Shah of Iran a deadline to expel all, all those Nazis. That did not occur. And they invaded kicked out the little Shah, brought in the other Shah, who is the Shah of Iran that you know. And now the Mufti went to Berlin and had this famous picture and newsreels and articles in which it was decided that the Arabs would become part of the Nazi establishment, the Wehrmacht, the military machine. They formed three divisions of the Waffen SS, the Skanderbeg, the Kama, and the Hanshar. The division has about 10,000 people. Not all of these divisions have 10,000. And the deal was, once the Russians, excuse me, once the Germans could invade Russia successfully and cross the Caucasus with the Arab oil that was at that time under the control of the British, then the Jews would be finally exterminated in Palestine. Now, I don't have time to go into the fact uh, that as part of these military operations with the Wehrmacht, there was that the Arab volunteers, not one guy, not 10 guys, not a thousand guys, but tens of thousands of Arab volunteers fought from Paris, to Palestine, especially in Yugoslavia. There were paratroopers, there were saboteurs, there were bridge builders, there were uh, artillery guys. Everything that could be done, they did. They, and they were the backbone of the most heinous group of killers in the Holocaust, the Yustashi, the guys who wore the eyeballs. Okay? I don't have time to go into all of that, but it's a brutal story that will curdle your blood. It's in this book. Okay. So, one more minute. Okay, look. Uh, all right, I'm going to take five more minutes. I don't care. I didn't come up here to tell you three quarters of a of the story. So, the Germans eventually lost the war. But 2,000 of the SS, Gestapo, concentration camp guards, and security officials escaped into the Middle East to take up positions in Egypt, in Syria, and other places, and to continue the war that Hitler started. And in fact, they expelled, in the Eichmann style, of complete confiscation of assets, 
approximately 800,000 Jews from Egypt, from Morocco, from Iraq, uh, f f from other Arab countries into Israel, attempting to create a demographic bomb. Is Israel attempted to take all these people in, working with a secret uh, aircraft uh, airline company called Air Alaska. That's how they got their start. And then comes the 20th century, the end of the 20th century, which was built by the days after the war of World War II. Now I'm going to give you an idea here. Hitler was the most popular name after Muhammad in the Arab world. The field marshal of the Egyptians right now is a guy called Muhammad Tantali. He was until he lost his job. Muhammad Tantali's got two brothers, Mussolini and Hitler. And you can Google Hitler Tantali, and you'll see he's it is, is an administrative official there. So they have this uh, they have this um, love letter contest in Egypt uh, to write love letters to Hit to Hitler. And one uh, soldier uh, officer of the Egyptian army writes a letter uh, to this uh, magazine called Al Musawar. He says, "My dear Hitler, I congratulate you from the bottom of my heart." He goes on and on, and he says, you are a great man, and one day you will rise again. Now, who was the man who wrote that letter? Anwar Sadat. Right. Now, what you're saying now, and I have to tell you, I believe that Sadat wore swastikas on his tie when he went to Jerusalem. You can check the pictures. Now, what does all this mean? I'm wrapping up. <laughs> Here comes this guy, he's wearing black, his name is Black, and he's got a black story, and there's no hope. Where's the hope for this? Well, there is hope. There is now, from the nation whose leader wrote the love letter to Hitler, a peace treaty. It's still in force, at least for a few more weeks. <laughs> there is peace with Jordan. There is a semblance of coexistence. And that's what this is about. Coexistence. No chance for peace in the Middle East in our lifetimes. Did you hear what I just said? No chance for peace in the Middle East in our lifetimes. However, there is a chance for peaceful coexistence now, today, and after a generation of peaceful coexistence could come a second generation of true peace and then a third generation after that, if it is successful and uninterrupted, of true fellowship amongst these cousins who argue about who is the favorite son of God. So, this is our hope. Now, who in the room knows the name of the Israeli national anthem? Anybody? You? What? And what does Hatikva mean? That's it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. <laughs>